now. Um, you may not remember this, but I used to host a radio show. I don't know. I guess it was maybe like two or three years ago on Sirius XM, and you were on my show at that time when oh, um, right. your your live multimedia project with the comeback special was coming up. So yes. yeah, yeah. I'm I'm looking at some notes and some stuff from you know from from that time. So at that time, you know we'll probably cover some of the same things because at, at that time, obviously it, it marked like a 16 year absence and return to the stage. But how many years yeah. has it been since you've done a proper studio record? It's been like, it took me like 25 years, right? 25 years before you were born. <laughs> the ring, the ring light on this is on this uh, must be working. Thank you. You're, you're, you're too kind. Um, well, I mean, it, I, I, I assure you I was, I was, born by them but that is a long time and i'm sure every interview you've done for insolment has brought up the obvious question of of why but i do understand that it might have been a song called we we can't stop what's coming that's actually from eight years ago a song about your late brother that might have been the catalyst for this whole kind of return of the the am i correct in that yes you are correct and it was during the making of the documentary um the Inertia Variations by one of my partners, Hannah St. Michaels, who's a Swedish documentarian. And she wanted to make this documentary, which was based upon the poem by John Tottenham, which was an English poet who lives in Los Angeles. And it was a meditation upon procrastination and idleness, really, I suppose. And uh, it was brought to me by my old friend, uh, J.G. Thurwell, who said it reminded him of me. And I read it. And I fell off the chair laughing, crying, and it it really felt like me at that period of time. So I contacted John, made uh, asked him permission for me to, to do an audio version, uh, like a spoken word version, which he agreed to. And I did it. And then Johanna loved it and wanted to make a documentary. And that documentary then, it grew into a very big multimedia project that involved photographers, architects, uh, obviously poets, as well as other musicians. Um, and, and a filmmaker in, in Johanna, and it turned into a triple album, a 12-hour radio broadcast, and another three-hour radio broadcast, a couple of art installations, and, and the documentary film. But during the making of that documentary, that's when my my older brother, Andrew, also known as Andy Dog, who did um, created most of the artwork for the, those albums, he fell ill, mm. and he died during the making of that. I'm sorry. And... And then I was I, I was trying to write a song. Johanna was trying to um, encourage me to write a song for the project. And there was a song I was working on about London, which I was having trouble finishing. But then when Andrew died, I was very, I just, this song, We Can't Stop What's Coming, sort of, sort of just poured out of me. And and the, and uh, and then I did a live performance at the end of the documentary, which was the first time I'd sung live in many years, and that's what gave me the appetite to go back to performing live. And then the comeback special project in 2018 happened, and you know, a sh quite a short world tour. And so right. it all it all led on from 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 Andrew dying really, making me realise you know what what I should be doing with my life. You know, life is very fragile and short. And you've got to make the most of it. Um, but interestingly, the song that I was trying to finish, uh, that Johanna was pressurising me to finish during the making of the Nursery Variations, ended up, I did end up finishing it, and it ended up being the first song I completed for Insolment. And that song was Some Days I Drink My Coffee by the Grave of William Blake. So that was the song about London I was, I was halfway through and couldn't finish. And then wow. that became the first song for Insolment. But of course, Insolment would have been sooner if it hadn't been for the pandemic, which obviously put the world on pause for a couple of years. And and also I I got struck down by a mysterious throat infection, which nearly killed me. Um yeah. and that was at the Yeah, that was a, an unfortunate situation. And that was at the start of the COVID pandemic. It was nothing to do with COVID. But That's I ended what... up yeah, I remember we, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I do remember we yeah. talked briefly about that when I, you know, inter interviewed you uh, um two or three years ago when the Comeback right. Special Project came out. But yes. I don't think, yeah. and we did talk a little bit about how scary it must have been to be in the hospital during the pandemic, but I don't think I was aware 
I don't think we got into enough for me to be aware of how serious it was. This was like a potentially fatal thing, correct? Yes, it was. Yeah, uh, I was, um, the, and the and the surgeon. I didn't want to have a stroke operation because I thought, you know, you 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 here you see these terrible situations where people have had tracheotomies and they they can barely speak anymore. So I was terrified of that, and I kept saying, I don't want the operation, don't want the operation. And then the surgeon sat on the end of my bed with all these staff around sat surrounding me and he said this is no longer about tone of voice this is life or death and so i thought okay i better have the operation and then um and then what happened was uh in the aftermath in the hospital you know i was very out of it on morphine and that's when i wrote the words or start to write the words to linoleum smooth to the stocking foot so i was trying to create something positive out the situation and that I thought it was so bizarre I was sort of semi hallucinating and it was such a strange experience to be in a hospital at that time because all of the staff were were obviously masked masked up uh, I wasn't allowed any visitors and it was um it was quite surreal and I remember writing in my notebook as I was lying there it, the things it, it put me in mind of um several um um films and books one of which was uh tarkovsky's solaris you know when they're up in the in the in the, in the uh, surreal and they start hallucinating and another one was um Lars von trier's the kingdom did you ever see that series uh, uh i have not one? but i i do i feel like i need to sort of when i write this article have like like little notations at the bottom you know yes. for people to yeah. get all your literary and cinematic references for future you know research i love that you have all these reference points but yeah no, I, I haven't seen that actually that's well worth seeing that was an, an early project that you did a television series but it was very very surreal and the other thing there was a short story a short book by the old author uh Evelyn Moore called The Ordeal of Gilbert Pinfold, where it was autobiographical. He went on a cruise and he was having a nervous breakdown. So these were my reference points because it was so surreal. And I was literally sort of hallucinating. I didn't know what was going on. And I thought, I've got, I got to keep notes throughout all of this because um, I knew it would come in useful. So that then obviously became quite fertile ground for, for creating uh, that song linoleum smooth so i drew upon all of that stuff and um but going back to your earlier question <clears throat> excuse me why um 25 years i mean when i did the last album naked self in 2000 that was with um through universal I, i'd left sony after 18 years and that was with universal and it was a very negative experience it was, it was very unpleasant that whole thing and I did a very long 14 month tour and Universal at that time there was this merger mania they'd taken over Polygram and then Seagram's owned them all then they sold them to Vivendi the French water company so it was this chaotic uh, feeding frenzy and merger mania and obviously a lot of people were being thrown overboard and there was nobody there that supported my record and it was very demoralising so I thought I need some some time away from music and bearing in mind and I've thought about this recently. I've mentioned it in a few interviews that uh, because I started a lot earlier than a lot of my contemporaries. So I was singing in bands when I was 11. Oh, wow. I was working in a recording studio full time at the age of 15. I formed another at 17. And I was a lot younger than a lot of my contemporaries at that time. Um, and the bands I used to hang out with, you know, like Wire and Throbbing Gristle, Cabaret, Voltaire, a lot of the post punk bands. I was a lot younger than them. And I'd been doing it, so by 2000, you know, I'd been doing it intensely, full-time for a long time. I was just very tired. I was burnt out. And I thought, I need some time away. I was living in New York at the time, and I, with my partner, we moved uh, to Sweden. And then our relationship broke down. And then that, you know, as, you know, life, personal stuff gets in the way of life, life became quite complicated. And I was traveling. I lived in Spain for a while, then moved to Suffolk in the English countryside. And then I got involved, moved back to East London. I got involved in local politics. Yeah, by that, I mean um, a conservation, you know, trying to preserve old buildings and, uh, you know, retain the sort of the historic character, particularly the area that I lived in, but also other parts of London that I didn't live in. <clears throat> and then, you know, I spent about seven years doing that. And then you realise um, 
not that it was much of a surprise, of course, but just how corrupt, you know, that the board is tilted, the whole thing is rigged. And I would speak at local council planning meetings and you're up against very powerful interests of, of very corrupt uh, uh, situations where the <clears throat> property developers, there's so much money involved and they've obviously got certain local council planning um, um, uh, figures uh, on board, you know, and you you can't say the C word publicly, the, the corruption, because you, you can't prove it. But you, there's this anecdotal people keep whispering and tell you stuff. Well, you know, this happened, this happened. And so it's quite demoralising, realising that no matter what the local community wanted, no matter how involved they got in all these public consultations, the decisions were already made beforehand. Mm -hmm. So it's all uh, quite boring, demoralising stuff. So I spent about seven years doing that. Mm. And then I got involved in film soundtrack work uh, yeah. with um, my younger brother, Gerard Johnson, uh, who's a film director, and, and Johanna St. Michael's, my ex-partner, who's a documentarian. So I pretty much exclusively worked with them, uh, which I really enjoyed uh, because, you know, those smaller, more independent sort of budgeted films, I really enjoy because you have I, I, I have more creative input and it's more enjoyable. The Hollywood stuff, which I've, been involved in in the past, I don't really enjoy that much because the bigger the budget, the, the, you become a smaller and smaller cog in this big machine, and um, you have you don't really have much creative input. I don't find so anyway. So I did that. I formed um, my own record company, Cineola, built a new studio, um, took on some staff there, started a small book publishing company. So I was very very active. Right. Yeah. You weren't very, exactly very like you didn't drop off the face of the earth or anything like. No. No. Very think. very busy. And, and then had another, so then I had another child as well, so another oh, son. Wow. Um, yeah, you were busy. you were busy, very busy, and then uh, with a, in a different relationship, so um, different mums, but um, but all very nice and harmonious, and everyone gets along. So I'm lucky with that situation, but it involved a lot of flying around, a lot of travelling, and um, yeah, so not much time for um, doing what I should have been doing really, which was writing songs and performing them. Well, I, I do want to ask, I mean, this conversation just go off in so many different lanes based on just everything you've been talking about. But I did want to ask a couple more questions about the the throat thing, just because you talked about how you didn't want to have the surgery and your doctor said you had to. And I, you know, obviously you, any singer would be concerned if it would affect their voice. Did it? Like, did you have to relearn to sing or do you sound a little different now? To, you know, did, how did it affect your voice in any way? No, it didn't, actually. They did advise me not to sing for six months, and I followed the um, doctor's orders very, very uh, strictly. Um, funnily enough, the first thing I sung, first song I sung, um, and it was, so the operation was in early May, and I didn't sing until New Year's Eve, and it was, uh, I was very drunk at a friend's karaoke New Year's Eve party, and I sung Suspicious Minds by Elvis Presley. My favourite um, Elvis song. It's a great song, that, isn't it? I love mm -hmm. that song. And it was great to sing. And it was joyful. I thought, crikey, I can sing again. That's amazing. So that was good. That's amazing. And um, when I'm touring, I, you know, there's no alcohol as I'm touring. And I'm quite strict about that, which makes it a bit more boring being on the road. But you have to be uh, you gotta disciplined. You got to take care of your instrument. How did, yeah. you, how did you get, I mean, sorry to ask so many, this is literally the last question I have about it. But like I said, mm. I was not a, aware that the infection was as serious as it was like do you know what it was like what caused it yes. it was so random um, right it was random but it was a pharyngeal abscess so it was an abscess of the pharynx and um when i was reading up about that so not the larynx but the pharynx so when i was reading up about it um in the hospital bed you know recovering because actually the hospital that i was in was um the london hospital which is now a new hospital, but it's on the site of the old London hospital, which is where, have you heard of the Elephant Man? Oh, yeah, that movie traumatized me. Yes, as well. I can't. I, I, I saw, I, yeah, that movie actually, like, quite literally traumatized me as a child. Well, that's I mean, where he was based. So that film, and John Hurt did a beautiful portrayal of him in, the, in that David Lynch movie. And um, that's where the Elephant Man did live. And it was, it was a true story. He was, he was there. So when I was... Um, when I was um, lying there in this sort of slightly hallucinogenic state, I was kept 
thinking I was back in Victorian times. And then I was looking up, you know, Dr. Google as I was lying there and then mm-hmm. they diagnosed what the problem was. And and it was, it, you know, it used to be a complete fatal um, situation. If you got diagnosed with that in Victorian times, for instance, that was pretty much a, a, a death sentence. But obviously with technology now with being what it is and skillful surgeons, you know, they slice, I've got the big scar across my throat, but they slice you open and, and drain it and, Lots of antibiotics. They say chicks dig scars, so you got yeah, that. there we go. So you got that going for you, and you got a good song <laughs> out of it. You got some art out of it, linoleum smooth to the yeah. stocky yeah. foot, which is a, yeah. a highlight of insolment. But obviously, yeah. I'm very glad that you uh, recovered and are touring and making music again. But that's just like we touched on a couple of songs from the album, but like there are a few, particularly because of the titles that stood out to me that I'd love to ask you about, but I'm going to quote from your press release, Matt. It says, this is, you know, on brand. It says, insolment encompasses characteristic topics ranging from love and sex, war and politics, life and death, to the meaning of what it is to be human in the 21st century. And a hell of a lot happened just in the last quarter century since the the released, uh, you know, an official, um, studio album and you know obviously you mentioned you got involved in local politics in in london but it just in general like how the developments of you know even the last five or ten years obviously there's been much to mine uh what's going on in the world like how much were like current events and stuff affecting what you were writing about for this record well they did and, and also during the nolium um that that altered state i was experiencing i had these um very sort of strong, um, disturbing feelings of this uh, nascent biosecurity state that's being erected around us, and because at that time the the the, the discussion about you know um, uh, it, it was almost like there was this dystopian world government sort of taking shape, using the COVID situation to suddenly push through a lot of draconian measures, and so digital IDs and people were being forced uh you know the 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 informed consent was thrown out the window and people were being bullied and threatened and it sort of created this very this very disturbing atmosphere of hostility very very divisive and that's one of the hallmarks I think of early 20th century that we've seen in America in Britain particularly extreme divisiveness I know obviously there's an election over here coming up probably the most divisive election in in many many years Mm -hmm. um and then you have to ask yourself how we got ourselves into the situation and i know that and one of the things i refer to on one of the more there's not many political songs on this album but kissing the ring of potus yeah that was definitely one that was on my list to ask about so please go ahead (laughs) yeah about that one really referring to the what i call the 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 coup is the neocon neoliberal coup of the last sort of few decades and whether you have these this pro-war agenda which has taken root on both sides of the Atlantic and so if you go back a few years you know I mean I think all the polit- major political parties seem to be seem to have been infiltrated by what I would call the extreme center this the ideology of war and privatization so for instance you go back a, f- a few years in the UK, we had a prime minister there called Tony Blair, who was the uh, who led the Labour Party, extreme warmonger. I mean, the Labour Party was traditionally anti-war and pro-public ownership, but the Labour Party was infiltrated; it became New Labour. Hmm. And so you had the policies of Tony Blair, which were pretty much and, and, and a Labour prime minister, which were pretty much identical to a Republican president in George W. Bush. The pair of them were sort of inseparable. They it, it launched the illegal war against Iraq. It, it unleashed this sort of war of terror a, a, across the globe, and the you know you have countless countries were being destroyed uh, as a result of that. But then, if you go fast forward slightly, you had David Cameron, who was a conservative British Prime Minister, in office the same time as Barack Obama, a Democratic president. Again, they had identical foreign policies, the same as. So the Democrats were the same as the Republicans, the Labour were the same as the Conservatives. So then they went on a rampage, launching illegal wars against Syria and Libya. And it makes you wonder, well, who's making the decisions? Because it doesn't seem to make any difference if it's Labour or Conservative, Democratic or Republican, in terms of foreign policy. I know there are differences 
in terms of certain differences in terms of domestic uh, policy, although in Britain there doesn't seem to be that much difference between the Tories and the Labour. Then. And so that anybody that and what was interesting was the 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 way that the language, or as I mentioned in one of the songs, the lexicon being weaponized, and that anybody that spoke that was anti-war and was so pro pro public ownership rather than things that were publicly owned being transferred uh, to a very wealthy minority. Anybody that spoke out against that was considered an extremist. Hmm. So you have either extreme left or ultra right if you were anti-war. And, you know, decades ago, say during the 60s or 70s, to be anti-establishment and anti-war would have been a, a badge of honour. But now right. anybody that's anti-war is considered a conspiracy theorist. So it's very interesting the way that it's been twisted and turned and the and the and the um the, the propaganda has been so effective at shutting down debate and you have this culture of self-censorship because people are terrified of being cancelled for saying the wrong thing and so you've got a very unhealthy you know i personally i um my beliefs are pretty pretty simple i'm anti-war i'm pro-peace i'm pro-freedom of expression freedom of speech i believe you know everyone has the right to express themselves, be who they want to be, as long as you're not, you know, not imposing it on others, and um, and uh, it, it's you know that people the, the equal opportunity. I'm not talking about um, equality of outcome necessarily, because that depends on what people do, but equal opportunity for, for everybody, access to good health uh, services, access to education. It's pretty straightforward stuff. But in this day and age, even those pretty sort of moderate views can be considered extremist if you don't toe the line, the narrative mm. of war and this sort of almost cartoon, cartoonish view of the world of good and evil. We are good; everyone else is evil, which is predominantly, which, which is um, dominated, particularly Britain, America, certain Western states as well. Which is, and so we're now in this, this terrible situation was extreme divisiveness it's just endless wars forever wars and do you, still, do you still live in the in the uk yes i live in the uk um back in london and i still travel a fair amount um but yeah we have a new government over there and they're already less popular than the last government <laughs> because they lie they'll say anything to get elected and um you know, the conservatives, the previous conservative government were hated. And Starmer's got in and um, it's, it's more of the same. You know, they just lie to people. And that what's happening is, is this is how you end up with situations like Brexit and Donald Trump, because people are lied to and lied to and lied to. And, 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 and Trump, the first time around, he promised, and you can see why it appealed to American voters, because he said, I'm going to drain the swamp. You know, uh, Washington is corrupt and everybody knows that. Of course. Yeah, I mean, but, that's but, maybe the one thing I would agree with with Trump is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And but when he got in, then he 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 invited people like John Bolton and Mike Pompeo into his administration, you know, swamp dwellers, you know, deep state swamp, swamp dwellers. I suppose the other, you know, the only other good thing to say about Trump is that he was he didn't cause any new wars. He's 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 anti-war. I mean, there was. um you know, Barack Obama have dropped even more bombs than George W. Bush because, you know, each administration bombs. But Trump, um, I suppose he didn't cause it. I mean, there was that half-hearted, he, there was a salvo launched against Syria, but he didn't actually start any new wars. But that's the only good thing because... <laughs> yeah, the literally the office, only. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's he's extremely narcissistic. Um, but you've got, yeah. to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sad situation because there's so many brilliant people in America that... You've ended up the candidates that the country ends up with that are selected for election, you know, don't represent the country. Um, and yeah. funny enough, I was in Washington recently, and whenever I'm in a city, I like to wander around and looking at the rest of monuments or museums or architecture. And uh, I paid a visit to the Lincoln Memorial, which I hadn't been to for, for several decades. And I just love reading his the words carved into that incredible memorial and how inspiring and uh uplifting you know and what the you know what, what america was founding on the, the high ideals and i imagine how they would be feeling now 
what Lincoln, someone like Lincoln would be feeling yeah. if you could see what's happened. Um, but it's always inspiring to go back to 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 remember those the, the, those high ideals, you know. And uh, is there a way to get back to them? Who knows? I don't but know. We, At the time yeah, that we're doing this interview, you know, the the American election is presidential election is three days away. So we will see. It's going to be interesting. I wouldn't. I would be lying if I said I'm not stressed out about it. Very, you know. Yeah. Very, I mean, it's nice to do an interview like this and have a little bit of distraction. But of course, the, the, the conversation is always eventually going to circle back to what's going on in the world. Um, you yeah. mentioned how you did, you know, you were involved in politics uh, at a local level, uh, conservationist level in London. Like, have you ever thought about, you know, doing like Peter from Midnight Oil did or whatever? You ever thought about going into politics yourself? Like, obviously, you're you're it's something you're passionate about and probably would be good at if you wanted to do it. No, I did. I did talk with the idea of standing as a as an independent councillor, um, just because I was so outraged at the levels of corruption and incompetence that I was seeing, and just the, also the way that the local the local communities are treated with absolute contempt by many, not all, because there were some lovely councillors and people that that do get involved for the right reasons. But the problem is, the ones that um, managed to sort of. Uh, climb up the greasy pole are the ones that seem to be the, mo the most corruptible ones the more the more um sincere and honest um uh, people those that are not corruptible will tend to get marginalized and so the ones that really thrive in that political environment are the ones that are more corruptible and i just thought you know what i couldn't bear being involved in that i don't think i'd rather i'd rather get back to what i love doing and what i'm better at doing i think is <laughs> Is, is is songwriting and singing and and that's one aspect of what i do i mean most songs i've written aren't political actually they're right. about love sex life loss all the things um, in but, the press release yeah exactly well exactly. i did want to ask about you know you mentioned the word dystopian a while a few minutes ago and um wasn't ai which is obviously something that everyone is concerned about right now didn't that kind of it was isn't that a theme it's definitely i believe what the the album title is referring to but is is there anything on the album that is like directly about that kind of new modern uh conundrum we find ourselves in well i tried to have it it's sort of in the background but it's sort of like a song like i hope you remember the things i can't forget which is uh the machines are here to correct our thoughts um really it's it's i i, I didn't want to write a song completely about AI, but I just wanted it to be um, in the general atmosphere, in the background of the album. And there's an interesting thing I read uh, a week or so ago. There was a report or a survey done um, in Australia, and you could apply this to any country in the world, I suppose, but they found that 70% of um, the people that took part in the survey, 70% now, and this is only going to rise, did not know, could not tell the difference between communicating with AI or a human online. Ooh, and that's, that's, and you that's, could apply that's that. That's frightening. It is frightening. And it's only going to get more and more sophisticated. Once you get, you know, this the voice synthesis is becoming very, very effective. And you're now hearing it, you know, you, you, you're hearing simulations of long dead famous people's voices. And of course, before long, it will be doing our own voices. And yeah. then, we, you know, it, in... For instance, five years' time, you and I could be having this conversation and you wouldn't know if it was me or not me, or vice versa. Matt, is that really you? Is that you yeah, exactly. that I'm talking to right now? Exactly. I'm and, just joking, it, but yeah, I know what you mean, and that be. is a little scary. And it, <laughs> and it could be a simulation of, of you. You could have, um, you'll have a, a version, a, a digital version of yourself created. It will look exactly like you. Lovely, lovely face with pink <laughs> hair and a pink background. <laughs> <laughs> and then and with your voice and it would have analyzed everything you've ever said or written or your interview so it would know exactly that you know the sort of answers that you would give the sort of questions you would give so this is really where we're heading and you know there there's positives and there's negatives it's like any technology you know nuclear power it can be used to to power a city and all the hospitals and the schools within that city, or it could be used to destroy the city. The same thing with AI. And it's the problem is there doesn't seem to be any 
safeguards. There doesn't seem to be any guardrails. It's just a bit of a wild west. And obviously, each government, as well as each big corporation, is trying to get a, a lead on on everybody else. And we don't know where it's going and what use it will really be put to. So we're in that that nascent stage. And I wanted to include that somehow because also, I mean, the title installment is um, obviously the moment the soul enters the body. I like the title because it ties in with earlier albums like Burning Blue Soul and Soul Mining. But yeah. also because, you know, what makes us human and as AI becomes more and more prevalent. And also, you may have seen those videos of these um, robotic creatures that are becoming more and more lifelike now. Mm. These, these robots and so once they start to merge these technologies with the voice synthesis and the and the ai with these uh, physical robots you, you know and i think musk has even said that he's going to release within the next year or two there's going to be these household butlers and robots will be released into the workplace and then they're going to start appearing in more and more places and in theory people think great we all get more leisure time but people need to work they need to have some purpose in their life rather than Everyone's just going to be sat around watching, you know, Netflix or Disney and, and ordering Deliveroo's or Amazon stuff. I think there's a whole philosophical debate needs to be had about, you know, what 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 makes us human, what gives meaning to our life. I don't think it's just being idle, open mouth consumers being waited on her hand and foot by robots. But so this technology is, is rushing. Is, is rushing forward and there's not been a debate. We don't really know what the consequences are. They could be wonderful or they could be terrifying, but I think the debate should be had. Absolutely. I don't mean to name drop in any way because as much as I would love to say I'm friends with Peter Gabriel, I am not, but I did interview Peter Gabriel um, about a year or two ago where we talked a lot about AI because I wouldn't say he's pro AI per se, but like he's his attitude is kind of like, this isn't going away you can't beat them, join them. You know, we can't resist this. It's happening. You know, the genie's out of the bottle, whatever. I'm paraphrasing. He obviously said it more yes. eloquently than me. Yeah. But yeah, he basically was like, we need to figure out a way to like work with this, harness it for good because it's too late to stop it. And, you know, it sounds like maybe you're kind of, that's kind of how you sort of think too, but I don't want to. Well, to yeah. And, and also there's also Musk's um, uh, response to it, which is, look, we can't beat it. We've got to sort of merge with it, which is the, you know, the um, Neuralink uh, that he's developing, which is basically turning humans into cyborgs. Otherwise, the IO would take over. So I'm not very sure about that either. But I think what needs to be done, there needs to be greater transparency within governments. There needs to be, you know, the same way that they attempted to do with, with nuclear weapons. There needs to be uh, certainly o uh, o open debate and there needs to be guardrails there needs to be checks on this because we we don't know where it's leading um you, you remember the old film what was it the um what, what was it called was it skylink no what was the um skynet the terminator films mm -hmm. where suddenly you know and they are uh, they are involving ai in defense because obviously it can respond to them far more rapidly than human op operators, but then it makes you wonder once the AI becomes more, um, it starts developing itself and that the humans then get to the point where they don't even know how how it's really working. They don't really know because it's, it starts to even create versions of itself. You get to a situation where humans are, are pushed further and further out of the decision-making process, which seems to be a possibility. I think that's a bit worrying. But yeah. then again, maybe AI would be more ethical and moral and humane than humans. I mean, if you look at it, the wars that are going on, the, the poverty, we don't do that great job of running the world. And there's also the theory that we are, humanity itself is a form of AI, that we are existing in some sort of a holographic universe. And if you think about it, how rapidly humanity has evolved and scientifically the last hundred years, it wouldn't take a civilization, what maybe forty or fifty years more advanced than us, to actually create us. So, if you think about it, hmm. you know we're on the verge. We are creating various life forms already, and certainly mutating them. And um, so, who knows? I mean, most uh, you know religions they talk about 
creators, don't they? And maybe God is just a, a 50 year more advanced version of uh, us. <laughs> Who knows? But Mind. we are in fascinating times. We really are. There's there's three other songs on Soulman that based on the provocative titles I wanted to ask you about. They might actually relate to all the things we've been covering now. But one is Zen and the Art of Dating. Dating's yeah. quite robotic these days. You know, you it seems like your partner now, so this isn't something you have to deal with. But you know, Tinder, Hinge, all that crap on the apps. Like the you know nowadays people, it's kind of the exception to the rule to say that you met someone in real life, like at a party or a bar or through friends, everyone's like, Oh, what app did you meet on? Oh, did you match with that person? Like, and <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a definitely, I find it dystopian in some ways. I mean, you know, and it's kind of like maybe the, uh, maybe the same mentality that people have about AI. I have about these things where it's like, okay, yeah, it's great. It's another way to meet people. It's a way to widen your yeah. social circle, maybe meet someone you wouldn't have met otherwise. But if that's, if everything, if, you know, I'm holding my phone here, if like every way you meet someone is here on your phone, instead of in having to actually leave your house and interact with people, I don't, I think it's a terrible thing for society. And I don't know if the song Zen and the Art of Dating is about that, but what is it that is. song about? Okay, it, great. It, I was right. it what, what is your favorite dating app? Would you say that you, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm um, joking. That's a perfect I mean, question. if I had to, I mean, the, this, this interview is not sponsored by hinge, but I guess I would say hinge. Cause that one is at least purporting to be for relationship seekers or people seeking right, something right. more than a hookup to people yeah, who yeah. want to actually like date. Um, but yeah. none of them, none of them are great. You know, at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, it's, um, well, the title of that is a playful song. That it's black humoured, and the title references both, you know, that famous book from the sixties, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, mm -hmm. which itself referenced a book, Zen in the Art of Archery, which I think was from the nineteen twenties or nineteen thirties. So it's playful about that, um, and it does comment. And the and the and the I suppose the pertinent line in that song is um, is when I say uh, maybe it's a it's a cliche but maybe it's true that only when you stop searching for love will love come searching for you so i suppose it's really about yeah i mean we we're living in a very you know i'm certainly not not above all this myself intensely consumerist materialistic um society i'm a bit, a bit of a shopaholic myself i i'm a bit materialistic and i buy stuff that i don't need a lot of the time but the way that relationship becomes sort of commodified uh, through these through these apps and also that i think there's a, an addictive quality to it that people will have the apps and even if they meet someone they can't get off the app so they'll continue seeing other people all the time and so people don't really know if they're fully connected with somebody because mm -hmm. they're still put themselves on the market or using aliases and the whole thing is very very addictive and it's treating and, and it's also in a way outsourcing your own independence in that you are not feeling complete unless you are connected with another person and i think that it's sort of disempowering in one way to feel continually that you you know some people are happy of being single there's nothing wrong with being single and being independent and, and and not having children and there's this pressure on people they've got to be coupled up they've got to be sexually active so there's a huge amount of pressure particularly on on younger people and then i, I think to the detriment of um self-development and mm -hmm. i think you know and it, it, it maybe is a cliche but when you know people really you know, work on themselves become fully independent fully happy and content within themselves that's the time they're most likely to attract their ideal partner and i suppose that's the point i'm trying to make that you know basically when you stop searching for something it's actively desperately searching for something it's because you don't really need it anymore that is when that situation will appear um you know a true um you know not a codependent sort of desperate situation but a true healthy nourishing relationship of two independent souls that sort of that, that, that choose to be to together because they've got something to offer each, offer each other so that's the, the really message behind that and it's said in a humorous way and, and the first verse is from the female point of view 
the second from the male point of view, which made me chuckle as I was writing it, that he was sitting at the bar eating crisps, which is a very English thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then he's angry. He was the one that left the relationship. And then he's a bit upset that, well, she seems happier than he does now. And he's getting very anxious. And then he's getting drunk. And then he's checking his recent searches and his biological urges start to kick in. So it was a playful, humorous song about a situation which is, you know, quite, quite a serious situation, actually, in that a generation being lost to to screen, screen ages, you know, not just a generation, several generations. I mean, we're all addicted to our phones, really. Uh, it's it's the, the very, very, very dominant on it in our lives now. Yeah. And in the one hand, we feel I don't personally use social media. I mean, my band, we have accounts, but I don't really use them myself. And I don't use it on a personal level. But you have, I have, you know, no people that think they've got thousands of friends. And we think, well, how many on Facebook or whatever, but how many of these people do you actually know? Do you sit face to face and have genuine, open hearted conversations with? And that's the, the important thing in life. People that you that you because there's an energetic exchange when people are in each other's company. Yeah. You know, it's not that, that it's different to a digital but there's you know if, if it's if it's uh, it could be pheromonal you know that people just like being in each other's company there's an energy exchange a subtle energy energetic exchange and we don't fully understand all that yet but why that is more nourishing than these than than than, than solely digital relationships um yeah. but we're 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 at, certainly at an interesting stage because we don't understand the full impact and I battle, like many parents, with your children sitting there addicted to the screens. It's a battle. It's a battle. But then again, what sort of role model have I provided? They'll look at me, sip, see, see me sit on my butt. I so think it's a you battle are a pretty role. good role model. Uh, role model. Uh, I said model. I guess I was combining your first name with model. Role model. But you're a good role model. I mean, obviously, it is interesting what you're talking about in that, you know, because we were talking about AI and stuff and also... There are a lot of people, and I don't want to slam people's life choices if they're happy, but there are people that are having basically virtual relationships, meaning, you know, they met someone online and, and they've literally never been in the same room together. They've never met in person, but they consider it a relationship. They consider this person their girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, but they've literally yeah. never kissed or physically been in the same room together. And then like, like that movie, Her with Joaquin yeah. Phoenix, like we're going to, yeah. you know, there are people getting like AI girlfriends and AI boyfriends who trade them probably better than yeah. <laughs> the real thing. But yeah. again, very strange times we're living in. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to be on the increase, uh, I think, as the, it becomes more sophisticated. And then there's also these, I think in Russia, they have them probably in other countries. There are these, um, are these brothels with these robots. So they, having sex with robots like these these sort of human-sized sex toys and they're proven to be very popular and um <laughs> Go you know, a bit of a step up from the old blow up doll uh, situation <laughs> i suppose but it's as these things become well if you look at you know with, with, when when the video cassette the video market uh, when the vhs cassettes were predominant the main driving force was pornography and it's the same with the internet one of the main drivers so i suppose it it's it's it makes sense in some way that the main driver, a lot of the of robotics, virtual reality is going to be the sex industry because it has yeah. proven to be that in the past. And I mean, we're going down a whole other world here, but that's just an interesting thing because, you know, a generation or two ago, porn's always been something people wanted to consume, but you used to have to make a lot of effort there. You know, you had to go to a video store or a movie theater in a raincoat or order something that came in a brown paper wrapper. And there was, worry that people came over that might see your pornography if you had some you had to like hide it under the bed or whatever and you know there was some kind of like it wasn't just you didn't just press a button on your computer and have access to pretty much any kind of scenario no matter how bizarre or fetishy at your fingertips no pun intended and um yeah that's a weird you know before it was like something where i don't know i i mean i've read all sorts of things about how ge a generation that's growing up kind of maybe having consumed a lot of internet porn before ever being in a situation where they might actually be able to be in a bed with a real life, warm, breathing, naked human body. Like their, their concept of sex and human interaction is just all wackadoodle because they 
been exposed yeah. to so much of that. It's like, yeah, it's all this stuff is stuff that's kind of happening because of technology. I know we're going yeah. down like such a weird path, but it's very interesting. No, no, absolutely. Uh, and and it's a real, it is a real, real worry. And particularly as this, as you say, it's at the, at the touch of a fingertip, it's available to young and younger people, you know, for six-year-olds, 10-year-olds can be accessing the same stuff as, as, a, as a person in their, in their, in their, thirties, forties or whatever. It's it's it is a real worry. And I don't think enough enough consideration has gone into it. I know there are um suggestions in Australia to ban and I would agree with this, to ban smartphones to anyone under the age of sixteen. And I I would oh, actually wow. agree with that. Because the kids when you see the kids, they are zombified and it's a battle. And the, the way also because their young brains can't seem to cope so well with it. They act like crack cocaine addicts when you try to get them off the phone they start shouting and screaming it's doing you know in the name of profit all sorts of damage is being done to, to to young people desensitizing in some ways and as you say the the implications for personal relationships uh, not only uh, um, uh, romantic and sexual relationships but any kind of relationships and any kind of human interaction seems to be affected in ways we don't fully understand how old are your kids you said you have uh, 27 and 12 oh 12 so i mean 27 is yeah. obviously also young but like yeah, yeah but 12, 12 is 12, like yeah. thick of all of this are you doing anything as a what are you doing as a parent uh, of the 12 well you just put put the control so on on his phone so that you know he has to ask permission but there, he's, he's he's a clever lad so he finds ways and there was one <laughs> i've got the password and he'll say what's the password and they figured out how to do it. I said, how did you figure that out? And he told me, he said, oh, I, I saw the reflection in your, I was wearing my reading glasses. I looked at the reflection when you were typing it in. And all these mates, they're all, they're crafty little kids. They're, they're clever. They find ways around everything. That's actually, that's really I was, funny. I was kind I'm of, impressed. I kind of, I was impressed on the one hand and a bit irritated on the other. Well, I do I do want to stress for people listening to this. Obviously, in Solman's not a super dark or bleak record. It gets into this stuff, but you know, we just mentioned Zen and the Art Dating Humor song. But are there other tracks on Solman that I haven't asked about yet that like you specifically want to mention that sort of speak to some of the themes? Yeah, let's say um I I want to wake up with you, which is obviously not a political song, but that was I'm very pleased with that song. Um and in, in various ways, that's because that's that's a song that it covers a period of time. It's looking back, sort of looking forward. It's quite philosophical. But um, the 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 second verse of that song is the moment, and, and this you know this relates to what we're talking about with um, dating or being in the same room as somebody. But I wanted to get that moment, or try to lyrically get that moment, just before sexual consummation between two people that moment where two people are obviously very attracted to each other but that moment when that the recognition that it is mutual and that sort of inevitability that they're about to sort of merge sexually and consummate the relationship and so um I wanted to capture a very romantic scenario, which was, you know, the detail of the, the the leaves, which trees outside the window, and then inside the room, the incense curling around the bedposts, uh, confidences shared, bodies bared, and then the looking into each other's eyes. And I, and I think I'm very proud of that lyric, because I think that really captures that moment really well. And then, and then the verse after that, which is, that realization that um, when it says that uh, uh, the summer doesn't end, it just moves elsewhere. The same with love, you know, that the, the initial love, what, the passion, and then the love, and it gradually dissipates. It's not because either person is, is incapable of loving anymore, but it, their their attention wanders and the feeling moves, and it moves on to someone else possibly, and just the cyclical nature of love and relationships and that's what i wanted to capture in that song and then and, um, and like i said most of the songs aren't political i'm sometimes pigeonholed as a political songwriter but i'd say 80 percent of my songs are, are not political they're about human experiences so that um down by the frozen river was about truanting or as you say over here um hooky is that what you say when you when you oh, playing hooky from, from school, school. 
Yeah. Yeah. So and then over or there, di- or ditching, ditching school, we say ditching. ditching yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was if, over in the UK. It's um, skipping school or truanting, which I did, and I was very naughty, and I I, I uh, ran off from school all the time. And so I wrote that was a poem that I wrote a number of years ago, and I found it again, and then I I revised it, and then set it to music that I collaborated with uh, my keyboard player DC Collard, wrote some beautiful music, and we worked on that together, and just the feelings about the education system. I was one of the lucky ones. And when I, I, I think about all these, you know, intelligent young girls and young boys that are given no support or encouragement at school um, and just slip through the net and end up, you know, making nothing of their life because they weren't given the necessary encouragement. So that's really what that song's about. Um, A Rainy Day in May, that's quite a romantic song. That is about a, a brief, a brief encounter that doesn't even involve between two people, that doesn't even involve them even talking. It's just catching each other's eye in a public place, and it's and it's a brief transformative moment. And suddenly, in that instant, all sorts of possibilities open up, um, fantasies of other lives that could have been led, and that 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 a brief chance encounter, even one that's extremely subtle, can have quite a transformative effect on one's day or even one's life. So that's really what that one's about. Um, Rising Above the Need is about um, sort of overcoming addiction and numbness, really. Um, Let's see... um, yeah, stripped of my addictions and deceit. I'm feeling somewhat un- incomplete. You see, too much was never enough for me. So that's quite autobiographical. I've had moments of, uh, um, you know, numb sort of addictive behaviour and then overcoming overcoming that. But all good things will come through the door to those who do not even want them anymore, which is, again, similar to the theme in Zen. And the, when you stop searching. So there's a, there's a quite a sort of a Zen broadest outlook to some of these and I wanted it to be quite a positive album and the positivity um, is there in, in some of the, the music's quite uplifting but also the message of um, let's see uh, yeah finding one's you know connecting with one's true self um, so that's that's uh, that's quite a positive hopeful message throughout the album what else uh, oh cognitive dissident is quite mm-hmm. Orwellian it's about the surveillance state and the censorships cancel culture that we're currently living in so that's quite straightforward um william blake that's a song about london changing london but also again the change in political landscape and the irony that william blake and i do sometimes drink my coffee by the grave of william blake but the irony william blake is now lionized by the british establishment as one of the if not the greatest british poet and painter but when he was alive, he was hated by the establishment. He was a dissenter, died a pauper. And now we're, again, in the age, in an age where William Blake is lionised, there's this increasing, as I mentioned, sort of censorship um, and uh, attack on uh, freedom of expression and freedom of speech. So that's that. what that's about. Uh, let's have a think. What are the other songs? I hope you remember we spoke about that. That's sort of the, you know, it's slightly inspired by some of the poems of John Betjeman, really, just thinking about it. It's quite a wistful look back at the past. Where and, do we go um, when we die? Is, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's definitely yes, the title that when we're talking yes. about the human condition and, 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 and the world, you know, all basically it kind of all the things we've been talking about, like that's definitely a title that jumped out at me. Yeah. And that was written for my, my late father who sadly died just before the start of the, the last tour. Mm, I was close sorry. to my dad. And um, so that, uh, and again, about this cyclical, what well, I believe, the cyclical nature of uh, consciousness and the human spirit. I mean, I'm I'm not a religious person, but I'm not an atheist. And I do believe that um, human consciousness, when released from this frail physical form, I don't believe it just... It, 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 there's an, a, an annihilation of consciousness or a season of consciousness. I think it just changes form. And so that's that's a hopeful song. And, and um, 
but also that third verse about taking packing up clothes and books, taking to the charity shop. That's something sadly many of us have to go through when older relatives die, and it's it's a very heartbreaking, poignant mm-hmm. thing. But also just the line, you know, sons become fathers, fathers become sons. The cyclical nature of 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 life and people that love each other, and and that was a uh, yeah quite an emotional song to write. Um, what are some of the other songs we've spoken about? Kissing the ring um linoleum what well, have we have we spoken about all of them i think i think Any maybe sort of... we've done a complete you know like annotated guide to insolment with yeah, matt johnson i, I yeah, love that I and have. i'd so i'm so happy i mean i was about to say i'm so happy you're back obviously you didn't go away you were you know doing things this whole time and in, in other capacities but i'm so glad that the the as a band with a studio album is back and um, I guess I'll wrap it up by saying I'm looking forward to uh, you're on tour right now and I'll be seeing you when you're yeah. in L.A. Um, and you did take a long period of, of absence from the stage between 2002 and 2018, I believe, when. Um, yes. Yeah. And then, of course, COVID but, and your throat issues, I imagine, you know, took you off the stage for a while again. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. How does it feel to be. You know, I assume I don't want to peek at the set list because I want to be surprised, but I assume your set list will have lots of installment songs, but also, of course, you know, the 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 the, the hits that we all, you know, want. Yeah. Uh, how, yeah. How does it feel to just be back like full on touring uh, both current and past music again? It's been wonderful, actually. And and we do we do in two sets. So we do we do installment um in its entirety we oh, take wow. a 15 minute intermission and then we go and do a longer set which is a retrospect set and we do songs from each of the albums so we, we time travel a bit around um the other albums but it's been brilliant the audience has been wonderful across europe was very was very very good uh london uh, good and and great being back in america again and i enjoy um each I wish there was more time to. I try to get out and about and see the cities because they're all so distinct, mm-hmm. and I so I'd like to enjoy it. the cities and the audiences are, are all distinct, and I, I, I'm, and I never take it for granted. Torn, but I think I really, I, me and the band actually just remind us of how lucky we are to be. You know, you travel. It's like you're in a bubble. You appear in these different cities, and you walk around the streets, and you get to meet some people, and then you. You perform for them. You do what you love doing, and um, move on again. There's a good, a great vibe amongst the band and the crew. We have a good laugh together, and it's it's very very enjoyable. And it's what I, you know, when I felt, was first in bands as a little boy of eleven or twelve, it was my fantasy to be doing what I'm doing and to still be doing it. I didn't and enjoying realize. It. I didn't realize you were that young you know when you mentioned a while back about yeah. being eleven and and or whatever much younger than. Robin Gristle and the bands you were hanging out with. I didn't realize you were that young. I mean, you were younger. Oh, no, than... no, no. When, I wasn't 11 when I was hanging out with them, but I was 11 okay. when I started my first band. But I was hanging out with all those guys when I was about 17 or 18. And Still they would have young. been probably 10 years older than me. So I was sort of 10 years younger than a lot of my um, contemporaries at that time. And, yeah, and when I was about 11, 12, we, would, we used to play little... Uh, youth clubs and people's parties and cover versions primarily although we did write some of our own songs but when yeah that little boy um i would have been very happy to think i'm not only you know made a good career at music but i still love doing it you know and, and that's i wouldn't do it otherwise I, I just would continue taking time off so um never take it for granted and it's always uh enjoyable coming over to america we always have a good time over here meet some lovely some really lovely people. Well, to be honest, it's everywhere. I mean, Europe is always great. They're all different. And I like the distinction between not only the different countries, but the different cities within the countries, the different cultures. I'm I'm all for, you know, uh, local cultures and local sort of ecosystems in terms of, you know, the, the, the history and, and the interests. I, I think it's important. You know, I'm, I'm not one for mass centralization of everything. I like there to be differences and distinctions between everybody um yeah and i'm very excited you'll be coming to los angeles hopefully you'll have some time to check out i mean i'm sure you've been here many times so hopefully you'll have some time to hang out and enjoy uh la while you're here i should let you go you've been so generous with your time yes, i do yeah i do have Love one last very quick question uh yeah spoiler question do you do kingdom of rain 
obviously you would because that would obviously be a duet with you know the, the wonderful Sinead of shoot but you know do you do you do that one in concert we don't do that all slow train to dawn they would they were duets because um yeah it'd be it'd be impossible really um we don't yeah i mean it's i was very upset um with the news about Sinead. i, I yeah. found that very very sad and uh, i'd lost touch with her for many years but when i did spend a bit of time with her years ago and we hung out a bit i, I really enjoyed her company she was a a great talent, very sharp mind, wry sense of humour. Um, and, you know, hearing about the sadness she suffered in her later years, it, it made me very upset. I was very sad. Yeah. Um, but no, we don't do that. But we do do other songs from uh, Mind Bob. Um, okay, well, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you one clue. Not okay. one clue, I'll tell you one song. There's a song on Mind Bob called August and September. And we do that. It's one of my favourite songs on that album. And I hadn't played that live for years, but we, we do a nice version of that, which is good. Awesome. Well, um, I, like I said, I'm looking forward to the show. And in the meantime, I've so enjoyed this interview. Thank you so much for saying so many fascinating things and taking the time to speak with me today. I think we did a really good interview. I think we went very deep. Lindsay. We spoke <laughs> about, we covered a lot of ground.